day. Um, I, was, I was talking in the break with a fellow Dutchman on how interesting it is to have a conference with not only designers, but actually people who are not from a design background, and to see how much our interests sort of converge and overlap, where you might say that the design industry is more and more getting interested in, in business and in laying a more an organizational foundation for design, where on the other hand, you see uh, a lot of enterprise architects here being very interested in service design approaches and design thinking. And I think we might be arriving at sort of the same domain here today. And we'll probably end up diverging from there in all kinds of different directions, but at least we have some common ground here today. And I must say that I'm very pleased by, this, uh, by the setup of this conference and by the people who are here. On the other hand, it's a beautiful day outside and there's drinks downstairs, so I can imagine that your attention span is limited, so I'll get going. Um, yes, the, the, the brand uh, perspective. I, I personally have a love-hate relationship with brand, and I'll, I'll show you why later. Um, but let me start by, by throwing some statements at you. Um, my first statement being, um, we're all looking for these experiences, uh, trying to develop these experiences that are innovative and seamless and cross-channel and unique and relevant and makes us heap of money, right? That's sort of, it's a, I guess a bit the holy grail that we're looking for. And whether you're a service designer or a customer experience designer or an enterprise architect or whether you're frontline staff, this is more or less what we're after. And my second statement is, that if you want to build that kind of innovations that have those attributes, it's all about coherence. And coherence is a word that I'll be coming back a lot today. Um, I think coherence is the one thing that we, uh, we need as a foundation for innovation. And coherence is basically um, the enterprise brand. I think um, the way I frame the brand, and of course I'll come back to this later, um, is that it builds internal coherence for organizations to work from, to take decisions by, to, uh, to focus on, to, um, to um, develop these guardrails that uh, Dion was talking about this morning. And this enterprise brand, if you build it well, and if you, if you co-create it, um, it can really be a very solid foundation for sustainable growth. Um, much more than customer insights per se, much more than unique capabilities per se, much more than a competitive edge, much more than differentiation. I think this, this enterprise brand can be the foundation for, for solid growth. Um, so we're talking about brand. I mean, brand, really? Um, I think that the concept of brand sort of got stolen from us or, or we're stealing it from them, I don't know. But if you look at brand from an advertising perspective, it's so very different from what I'm talking about today. So let's briefly give you a little uh, tour of history and it all started here, right? Branding livestock. I mean, brand in, in Dutch, brand means to burn. Um, there he is, the man himself, Melvin Flew Brand. Um, is that, is your brand, is that from Brandt? Do you know the origin of your name? Yeah. Um, from? And what is Ulf? Brand Ulf. And, and then I still don't get it, but. <laughs> um, branding livestock was basically a sign of ownership. And I guess if in a very primitive understanding of brand, it's still a sign of ownership, right? If I see the Apple logo here, that means that Apple has created this product. Um, interestingly enough, if you see how um, at some point products start to move away from the manufacturer into the store, so this sign of ownership becomes even more important because the, own, the original owner isn't there to, um, to sort of signify the quality. So this says Procter & Gamble, they have created this soap and I have this association with Procter & Gamble. Okay, it's probably gonna be a good soap. So I buy it from someone, you, and you are not Procter & Gamble, but you have a store in soap, right? So this sign of ownership becomes a sign of quality. Interesting first step in how branding started developing and then it gets to sort of transforming functionality into meaning, you know? So the brand becomes Studebaker, 
different by design. I mean, what the hell does that mean? But somehow they're no longer, I mean, they're talking about functionality, right? So, okay, so you can fit a lot in this car, but they're capturing that functionality, transforming it into some kind of meaning, some kind of emotional appeal, where they say we're different by design, it's too bigger. Um, so here branding becomes much more than a sign of quality, it becomes a sign of meaning, it becomes a sign of sort of emotional appeal. And, and that goes on in the 50s, you know, there's no match for Mercury style. So we sort of start believing that this car runs and that it does functionally what it's supposed to do. Um, and branding becomes this extra layer around the product of meaning. If you, if you, if you read Ferganti, he talks about meaning a lot. Um, Meaning, style, appeal, um, I feel connected to this product, all these things that have nothing to do with how it operates and how it functions. Now that's where it kind of goes wrong. I mean, then you get Coca-Cola, and we all know that Pepsi tastes better, right? In blind test, we all know that. So it gets to this whole lifestyle where, I mean, you have carbonated water with a bit of sugar in it, but hey, we all want to pay three, four, five euros per bottle because you buy this whole lifestyle. So branding becomes so detached from the product that it gets a bit dangerous because it means that the product can be anything and there's this layer of branding around it, sort of a shield or a facade that we actually buy into. And that's where it really goes wrong. And then you get Nike doing child labor and sort of hiding behind their brand, right? Um, this is, I think, the, the highlight, or let's call it the, like the, the dip of branding. This is, I think, what was this, 1999 maybe? Anyways, in 2000, Naomi Klein wrote No Logo. And thank you very much, Naomi Klein, because she sort of shook up the whole branding world and says brands are evil and they're capitalist vehicles for, um, for basically uh, ruining the lives of little children and blah, blah, blah. Um, she overdid it a little bit, I think. She was partly wrong because she blamed things on branding that weren't really about branding. But what she did do is sort of turn things around and said, hey, listen, your brand is not something you can hide behind as an organization. No, your brand is a window to the world and you should open it up. And basically, if you do bad things, you do bad things to your brand and then uh, you do bad things to your whole company. So the brand is no longer a facade to hide behind. No, it becomes a very vulnerable, very important aspect to, um, to live up to. So all of a sudden, it's no longer just about making promises. It's about living up to promises. Now, living up to promises is all about innovation, experience design, service design, right? So that's where also you see sort of a shift from branding being owned by advertising to fulfilling brand promise being owned by us, you know, by designers, by people who are involved in innovation, people involved in product design, experience design, UX, you name it. And then moving on in time, um, person of the year is you. I think this was 2006 where brands are no longer um, directed top-down by brand managers, controlled um, uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a, a very well-controlled environment. No, brands are owned by you, by us. We, we are the brand. We own more or less Facebook, or do we? I mean, it's interesting, right? It, it, it's always this, do we really? I mean, if you look at Threadless, Threadless is this website where we can all upload our t-shirts and other people can buy them. And the whole business model is this community-based model that Dion was talking about this morning. Um, who owns this? I mean, obviously, there's people who own the brand Threadless, but they will be nowhere without the community. So the whole value proposition is around the community. And I find this very interesting because... Again, this is a whole new game. This is a whole new way of branding. This is not top-down branding. This has nothing to do with, with advertising, with creating this brand promise. This is all about co-creating an experience together, and that together makes the brand. So um, what you see is there's, there's a group of people who have developed a value proposition. There's a group of people who are co-creating that value proposition, and the brand is all about that very intricate relationship that is happening there. And there we get to my definition of branding. Um, I think branding is really about building a coherent vision on the relationship 
that an organization aspires to have with its stakeholders. So it's all about that relationship, right? It's all about, branding is not about who I am. I mean, I can, you see that a lot in, in, in small companies when they say, my brand values are, I stand for this and this and this, no. Um, then if you go to the fast moving consumer goods, they will say, our, we have researched and we have customer insights proving that our brand should be this and this and this and this, right? So they have to complete outside-in perspective. I think it should be somewhere in the middle. It should be about this relationship, about I have something to offer and you have something that you want from me, but hey, you have also something to offer to me. And it's about how can we build this relationship. Um, so that's a bit of a different perspective on branding than uh, people from advertising might adopt, right? Um, I think that's the kind of branding we're talking about when you were talking about enterprise branding and uh, when we're talking about the, the kind of branding that can actually drive innovation. So let's, having said all this, having sort of set the stage, let's look a bit closer at innovation. Um, I said earlier that innovation is about coherence. It's about convergence. That's interesting. I mean, I, I was taught in school that innovation is all about creativity. It's all about divergence coming up with new ideas. And if you look at the aesthetics of innovation, um, Dirk talked very nicely about art and business. The aesthetics of innovation is all about this kind of stuff, right? These very creative rooms. I mean, this is an office. I have no idea what it is, but this is um, Google Office. We're all made to believe that if you want to be creative and if you want to innovate, you need to be in these kinds of places. The aesthetics of innovation are all about messiness and post-its and teamwork and this kind of stuff. I mean, I think innovation and creativity would look differently if 3M would decide to adopt a different color palette, right? We all know these images so well. Post-its on the wall, um, wild scribbling. This is, this is what innovation is all about. And now, I kid you not, um, this is creative furniture, and I'm sorry for the SAP people in the room because they've been involved in the Hasselblattner School of Design thinking, but seriously, this school has created a line of furniture that's supposed to help us be more creative. They're standing high tables because if you want to be creative, you have to stand up. And they are whiteboards that you can drive around because you need to be flexible. I mean, seriously, people, I say, WTF, um, is this really what helps us innovate? Is that really so important that we create this aesthetic of innovation? I think personally, and this is a bit of a bold statement, we do not really need more ideas. That's not really what we need, right? I mean, look at the innovation funnel. It's fucking full of ideas. We have ideas by the zillion. We're trying to reduce ideas, right? We're all working very hard to get rid of all those ideas, so we end up with these three good ones. Right, so is it really going to be help to have more post-its with more ideas here? I'm not sure, I don't think so. This is a report that um, Booz came out with in uh, 2010, where they, um, they researched 1,000 companies and they looked at what made them successful in innovation. They found out a very interesting thing, um, where um, investment in R&D used to drive in, uh, innovation results. So basically, the more you invested in R&D, the more successful innovation would be, the more successful you would be at innovation. Um, this report uh, proved sort of a, a tipping point, where actually they said spending more on R&D won't drive results. Um, it's um, strategic alignment. So can you align different departments together? Can you align silos in an organization? Um, a culture that supports innovation, right? A culture which is like a shared understanding, a vision, maybe shared values, um, the ability to be creative, autonomy, um, co-creation, collaboration, that would drive innovation much more. And then they research what that does to you know, 30% higher enterprise value growth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I cite this report because I think it's so very interesting and it sort of proves a different paradigm on creativity and innovation. It's not so much investing in R&D 
ideation, um, spending money on getting people to cook up new stuff. No, it's building a platform, a shared platform of vision and values um, where people can innovate from, a culture that supports innovation. Um, why is that? Um, if you look at enterprise problems, the, the problems that we're dealing with um, that require innovation, that require a new approach, they are often very open, complex, dynamic, networked. You know how it is, you know, their problems are ill-defined. They don't really have a very fixed description of what they are, right? We don't really know what the problem is before we start solving it. They're complex, meaning um, um, they actually, it's um, all these different elements related to each other. So if you start to tinker at one end, uh, stuff at the other end starts moving. Um, they are dynamic, uh, meaning they change while you work on it. They're constantly changing, so change is a given. And they're network, meaning you have all these different interdependencies between stakeholders. These are the kind of problems that we're dealing with, and they're often called wicked problems, or at least ill-defined problems. Um, and I think to deal with these kind of problems, certainly you don't need more ideas. Uh, po Post-its are not going to help people. It's not, it's not going to work. Brainstorming, no, please, let's not brainstorm more. You know, to solve these kinds of problems, you need rigor. You need a very solid foundation to work from, and you need to know what you're doing. You need focus. You need to make choices. You know, you need to allocate resources to the right kind of um, activities and not to the wrong kind of activities. So what these companies need, I think, is rigor, focus, and structure that help them basically kill the bad ideas and grow the good ones. What I like for companies to do is not think of funnels like this because they're a waste of money. Let's see if we can reduce all that stuff and have a funnel that goes like this, and then bring in knowledge from other companies. Was that? <laughs> oh, you want me? Sorry, it's my presentation. <laughs> so that's what I talk about when I say they need coherence, um, and that's what I talk about when I when I say uh, innovation is about coherence. Um, less about divergence, more about convergence. Less about um, breadth, more about depth, um, very much about making the right choices. Um, and making the right choices and focusing, um, that is where the enterprise brand comes in, and that's where I think the enterprise brand can really help. So you remember this definition, right? Um, the relationship an organization aspires to have with its stakeholders. Now, Milan, in his book, um, frames the enterprise as this whole intricate networked uh, system of organization, partners, suppliers, customers, etc. Um, I'm a very simple human being and I <laughs> have still, you know, the inside world and the outside world. I'm sorry, I know it's going to be more complex than this, but this sort of simplifies what I think um, most organizations these days look like. And then you have this nice figure eight shape where Innovation processes tend to go like this, you know, there's some kind of research in the outside world, whether it be design research, market research, market data, anything that gives you input. Um, you start to make sense of the data and you internalize it. Um, and then you focus, you make choices, you draw conclusions, you say, here we have something to work with. Um, here we have a certain data point that stands out that we can work with, or here we have a particular interesting insight that really um, um, uh, triggers our imagination. Or whatever you do, you make some kind of choice here. And I think this is the aspect that is often overlooked. You, innovation is about making choices, right? You make a choice here. Um, then you design, then you implement, and the loop starts over. Um, now, the interesting thing here is that we see an intersection here, right? So to stay with the theme of the conference, this intersection has sort of a lens shape. And this lens is what I want to talk about a li little bit more. Um, it's a Polaroid lens, so it, does it, it, it focuses and it filters. It's interesting about Polaroid. Um, what it does, what this lens does basically is 
you have all these internal drivers for change, right? You have certain capabilities, resources, you may have certain IP, you may have, I don't know, maybe you've developed a new technology, maybe you've acquired a new company. There's zillions of internal drivers for change that are possible. And then there's the customer. And what this lens does, it basically helps you focus all these possibilities into something that is relevant for them. Because if you don't do that, you end up throwing stuff at the market and hoping it will, it will land somewhere. What this lens does is help you focus. It helps you make the right decisions and sort of say, if we bundle these resources, it will become relevant for the outside world. If you don't do that, you're basically shooting with the gun of hail. Now this works the other way around as well, but it works as a filter. So you have all these external drivers for change, right? You have trend reports and you have customer behavior research and you have Lord knows what you can think of, new technologies, competition. Um, um, it can be anything that happens in the outside world that makes you think, oh, we need to innovate. We need to do something here. We need to, uh, to act. And there's the enterprise. And again, this Polaroid sort of filters and says, okay, this may be relevant, but this may be not relevant. And this little trend here or this insight here will leave to the competition. You know, I think, again, if everything would be completely relevant, you would be paralyzed, right? You would be completely against the wall, not knowing what to do. So again, what this lens does, it helps you make choices. It helps you say, hmm, that's a very interesting customer insight, but this is not our target group. Or it helps you say, that's a very interesting technological development, but we'll leave that to our competition because that's not our focus now, right? So again, this filter really helps you to innovate in a way that's very focused and not just all over the place. Um, if you combine the two views, you get a really interesting animation that doesn't really add anything to the story, but <laughs> <laughs> had to do it. Um, this one is also in the book. Um, we all know this. I think it was originally coined by, um, by Tom Kelly from IDEO. Um, if you innovate, you have to look at desirability. You have to look at viability and feasibility. These are the three pillars of successful innovation. Will they want it? You know, will customers want it? Um, will we make some money on it? And can we make it? Right? So customer, business, technology. Great model, very interesting, but I think something's missing. Who wants to make a guess? What's missing? I think, personally, should we do it? Should we actually do it? I mean, I can think of a zillion products that are viable, desirable, and feasible, and still I'm not remotely considering to put them on the market, because it's not for me to put them on the market. It puts f it's, it's for someone else to put on the market. Right? I think the Apple iPhone could be viable and feasible and desirable for Samsung, but still they don't do the iPhone, they do a different phone. Why? Because they're Samsung because they're, and they're not Apple, right? So the whole brand perspective misses in this very fundamental model. And the brand perspective helps you decide, okay, it's viable, okay, it's feasible, okay, it's desirable, but should we actually take the time and invest the money to do it, or should we leave it to competition? So again, it's about focus. Again, it's about making the right choices, and innovation is not, there's, there's zillions of innovation opportunities that fit the three domains, but there's only very few that actually sit in the middle. And I agree with you, you say that's where the enterprise vision comes together, and I think this enterprise vision is basically your brand, is basically what we're talking about here. So does it match your brand? Um, this kind of, y using the brand this way in innovation um, means, and this is, this is directly from my book, it's a source of inspiration for ideation, then it's sort of this guardrail where you don't want to stray across, and it's a filter in the end. Now usually the brand police within companies will, um, will sort of put that filter in the end and say, sorry, it's not on brand, so, uh, so ditch the concept, it's, it's, not, it's not going to market. Um, I think what we, what we need to do is build brands that have this inspirational role and have this guiding role. Now, these 
this guiding role is interesting because that was um, what we usually think of as like design principles um, or as design guidelines, but they are basically enterprise guidelines. They're innovation guidelines. They help you, they tell you what to do, what not to do, what to focus on, what not to focus on. Um, this is my son, and um, he loves to climb trees. And he um, loves to climb trees not because it's feasible or viable or desirable. <laughs> he loves to climb trees because he can, because he wants to, you know? Because maybe up there the view is better than down here. And if not, he'll at least enjoy the climb. Now, I think um, this is what innovation should be. You know, this sense of curiosity, this sense of sort of organically wanting to go somewhere because you can, because you have the, the ability, because you have the vision or the, 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 the will to do something. Not necessarily because your competition does it, or because you've read a trend report that tells you to do it. No, just because you can. And I think uh, framing the brand as a driver for innovation is framing it as um, looking at um, innovation as something very intrinsic and organic and authentic, not as something that you need to do. Um, Dion talked this morning about disruption. Um, it can come from the outside, but then it always hurts, right? Innovation driven from the outside always is very painful. We don't want to change if someone forces you. Innovation from the inside, self-disruption, hmm, that's, that tastes a lot better, you know, because if you want, if you have the ambition and the aspiration to do better, it will be much easier, much less painful, and will actually um, be a very pleasurable process. So how do you build these kind of brands? How do you do that? Um, I think there's, um, there's a f when I was making this presentation, I discovered something. Um, brand building as an isolated process, I've never seen it succeed. You know, hiring a brand agency to sort of come up with your four core values and then doing these endless programs of implementing that into the organization and having people you know, learn the four values by heart. I don't think it works. So let's look at a different way of building brands. First of all, I think um, brands should have four dimensions. From an organizational perspective, they should be authentic and original. So sh they should match what you actually can do. They shouldn't be made up. They should be something that actually fit with who you are, where you come from, what you're good at. For the customer's perspective, should be relevant and meaningful, right? They should tap into real insights. They should tap into real human needs. Um, from a marketing perspective, marketing communication, they should be inspiring and engaging and challenging and sort of aspirational. You know, they should sort of set the stage. Um, and then from a product development perspective or a service development perspective or an an innovation perspective, they should be understandable and usable and practical. They should actually guide innovation. They should actually help you make choices, right? You can typically um, map companies here. Like a typical fast-moving consumer goods company would be uh, very much here, right? Very much based on customer insights and very much inspiring and engaging. But if you go to a product manager who has to develop the new taste ice cream, they'll say, let the branding people talk. I'm, I, have my, I have my own KPIs, right? They don't feel connected to the brand at all. Um, then you have these sort of nerd brands, these small technological-based companies that typically sit here, very much product-based. Our brand is about actually the quality of the weld of this thing or something, you know, they would frame that as the brand. And customers would say, I don't care as long as it doesn't tip over. Um, so it's, it's an sort of a nice exercise. And I think smack in the middle is where the best brands sit, right? Where, where uh, when we think of good brands, they manage to, to, to cross these chasms and to combine the best of both worlds. Um, I think building these kind of brands is, they sort of emerge from experience design. 
So you don't build a brand first and then start to design the experience. No, they actually emerge from the experience design. While doing design work, you start to discover what it makes, what makes you tick and what actually works for you and what customer insight really match your core values, etc. And then you let them infuse the experience design process. So there's, there's research, there's design, there's research design, there's lens sits there in the middle. And while you go through that process, your brand becomes manifest and it becomes more and more tangible and more and more usable and more and more um, differentiated. So basically, I'm, s I'm making the statement that service design processes or experience design processes build brands and help to make brands manifest. And I'll take you through a, t a couple of tools to, uh, to show you what I mean. Um, so while developing these experience innovations, you discover which customers really click with you and which don't. You start to discover which core capabilities are actually relevant to your market and which are not. You start to discover um, which value propositions make sense and which make not. So design as a way of creating brands has been for me in my, in my practice very successful, much more so than um, sitting there and, and cooking them up and coming up with values or whatever. It's much more this joint, this shared experience of going through a process of experience design that has built powerful brands for my, my clients. So I'm going to take you through a couple of tools um, just to sort of show you how we would do that. Um, so typically a, a project that I'm involved in starts with um, context research, customer research, where we have these online diaries that we use. Uh, it's a tool we develop basically to uh, enable people to keep a diary of their experience. Um, call it 7 days my lifecom um, Now first what we do, and I loved what Dion said about working out loud, the first thing we do is invite our customers to keep a diary for themselves. Right? They are usually also the user of the products or services that we work for. They also hold insurances. They also have a telephone uh, communications provider. They also bank. So we ask them to keep a diary themselves. So rather than saying we are the company, you are the customer, you keep a diary, and then we go into that, no, we think it's much smarter to think of yourself as a customer as well. So that's the first mechanism that we use. Um, the second one is that we give access to our client while these diaries get filled, so they can see progress, they can comment on it, they can, they can copy paste, whatever they do, it's completely open to them. And again, it's working out loud because we are currently involved in a project where it's really hard to recruit people and they see that it's hard to recruit people and the diaries aren't filling up very quickly. So, okay, so they see that. It's part of the process, part of the learning process of doing this kind of research. Then we do what we call co-analysis. So we are not the type of consultancy that then close the door and sit there and analyze the data. No, we hang it up on the wall and we invite our, cust our clients. So these are all, uh, this is a project we did for eBay. People from different eBay companies across the world um, going through these diaries. What do you see? What do you read? What stands out? What, 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 um, what gives food for thought, right? So again, it's, um, um, it's a communal, uh, approach to research and it's much more powerful than isolating it, coming up with insights, writing them up and handing them back to the organization. Um, a lot of our work involves around home interviews. We always take the client, right? So we, we firmly believe that this is not something we should do, no, it's something we should do together because there's nothing um, as uh, confrontational and inspiring and enlightening as a good home interview for someone who is usually behind their desk all day. You know, who and you can bring in customers to the focus group room and you can put them behind a mirrored wall, etc. No, bring them to the house. Bring them, to, you know, bring them to the real, the real people and, um, and confront them with, the, with their, own, um, their own customers. Again, that data gets co-analyzed, which means um, not only um, read through them, but co-synthesize, so come up with insights, uh, pinpoint where the real interesting um, quotes are, etc. 
Um, then based on the basis of that, we may do customer segmentation. And again, the interesting thing is we may have interviewed only 20 people. And how can you, how can you segment on that, right? I mean, there's no statistical basis for segmentation, but we always do it anyway. And it always ends up being more useful than the piles of segmentation reports that they already have that are based on uh, quantitative data. So because it's so close to the heart and so close to the real people, and because they've been involved, you can suddenly say, hey, we see these two segments. There's John there, and there's Anne there, and they're actually two customer segments. And, you know, N is one. There's no statistical proof for that, but it clicks with them, and it helps them to design better. And I think that's what it's about. Um, then when we, for example, when we make personas, um, there's one thing we've learned that is personas are not only inspirational tools, they can also be uh, very closely connected to business metrics if you create them in such a way that you can actually validate them. So we've learned how to create personas that um, in large-scale questionnaires, you can have people answer a number of questions and they'll end up in a certain persona, which means that per persona group, you know how large they are, you may uh, know um, what the uh, net promoter score per persona is. You may know the number of complaints per persona. So all of a sudden, it's no longer a fluffy design tool just for inspiration. No, it's a, it's a business tool, right? And again, it's a way of um, co-creating the understanding, co-creating this brand vision together, where you also involve the business guys, the, the customer intelligence people, in what is usually the kind of customer empathy that is reserved for design or marketing, right? So you get a much more holistic understanding of the, comp of the customer, and it's much better ingrained in all the layers of the organization and throughout all silos. The same goes for when we do customer journeys, and we've done a, a great session this afternoon. There's a lot of metrics here in the top row. So we try to uh, use a lot of business metrics and allocate them to stages in the journey, not because we find this so enjoyable to do, but because it helps to get other people on board that think differently, that are maybe not so interested in the soft side, the inspirational you know, customer insight side, but they're interested in KPIs and metrics and NPS and uh, uh, complaint levels and churn and all that stuff that you can measure. So why not combine the two and again, get a whole bigger group of people on board around these kind of tools and instruments. Then, uh, typically, we would design these, these principles. And again, um, like I said, design principles help you sort of guide experience design uh, and, and, and uh, make sure that you don't go overboard. What we try to do is not only have those be nice guidelines, but actually design what kind of value do we derive from these principles and how are we going to measure this? So we give the experience dashboard not only to the service designers or the experience designers or the UX people, but actually to the customer intelligence people. And so now measure the effect. Now make sure that this is actually happening in practice and that people are actually happy with the result. And then when we do a touch point audit, um, we look at touch points not so much from the perspective of uh, do customers like it? Are they happy with it? But is it on brand? Is it a unique touch point that's different from competition? So for a website or for a call center experience or for a bill, can we do it in a way that is connected to our brand and is not something generic and unique? Just some examples of how these different service design tools can help you build a brand and help you uh, focus in innovation. I'm coming to the end, and I want to show you this last slide. This is a call center in Manila where I did a project. Um, it was a project for Virgin Mobile in Australia. And Virgin Mobile have off-sourced their, um, um, their call centers to Manila because it's the same time zone, and their English is okay, and they're half as expensive. And they got all these complaints from the call center. They got complaint after complaint. It was such a horrible experience. Um, so Virgin said, uh, something needs to happen. And um, luckily enough, they said, let's first send someone over there and do some research with these people and see what's going on before we start 
looking for a different call center or we start to uh, put it in Australia anyway. So we went over there and we worked for a week with these people. And we did a lot of role playing and we did a lot of uh, sessions around how would you resolve this call and how would you work with this problem. And these people were absolutely amazing. They were fantastic. They were perfectly able to deliver an outstanding customer experience. Why didn't they do that? Because they had shitloads of, of, of metrics and, and scripts to go through and they had 49 points they needed to cover in each call and the whole way of managing them was horrible. So it was the company, not the, not the people. What I'm trying to say with this, uh, with this last slide is basically um, you can research your customer all you want and you can delve deep into the lives of customers but until you've understood your own staff and your own people you're never going to build that match you're never going to build that relationship so again this lens helps you to say yes we understand the customer now but now let's go inside what do we need to develop to in order to get deliver that experience and i think um, this combination of inside out, outside in thinking is very much required for experience design. And I think the, the brand is a very good way of, of framing that and, 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 and providing that with the right of focus, the right foundation, um, and the right inspiration. And that's it. Um, you can contact me here if you want. I'm very curious about your comments. Thank you very much.